In your Bibles tonight, Romans chapter number 2. As we come to Romans chapter number 2, the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Rome, a group of, of saved people, a church, a group of believers. He's writing here, and in the conclusion of chapter number 1, he is detailing the judgment of God that's going to fall on God deniers and wicked, evil sinners. He says in verse number 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers. Now I can just imagine as this letter is being read to the church at Rome that the uh, folks sitting in the pews with their hair done the right way, their clothes on the right way, smelling the right way, having uh, a form of religion, a religious person. I can just imagine them saying, Amen, preach it, Paul. All them hell-deserving, wretched sinners, and rightfully so. Our sin separates us from God, and these things that are listed are terrible. And he continues, he says, They're backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And we conclude chapter number one, and you can hear the church say, Amen. God is judging sin, and they can. It's true. It's but then when we turn the page to chapter number 2, like the old preacher said, sometimes we say amen and sometimes we say oh me. But in this passage of scripture, it goes from amen to oh man. The church, the Christian, the religious, they have to answer to God too. Just because you're religious doesn't mean that you're not sinful. Just because you're religious and not a partaker of some of these hideous sins that were listed in the previous verses does not mean that you don't need a redeemer. And Paul says, just in case your amen got a little too loud, let's talk for just a minute about, oh man, the religious that need a Savior also. The Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 2, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man. Whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well doing seek for glory and honor. And immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. Our message title comes from verse number 11. There is no respect of persons with God. And the bottom line is, now Paul says, everything I've said in chapter 1 is very true. And there's heathen that have denied the existence of God, who have denied God in creation. And the byproduct of denying God in creation is all the wickedness that I've mentioned in chapter number 1. But he says, hey, hold on just a second. Any of you people who wear the cloak of righteousness and religion, 
and somehow think because you look different, smell different, talk different, act different, and aren't guilty of the basest of things that I mentioned a few verses ago, he says, I want to remind you. He says, therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man. He says, I want to remind you, there's no respect of persons with God. Written to believers, the church, religious people. The Apostle Paul wants to set some things straight and make certain that the people who are attending the church at Rome are not guilty of covering their sins with a form of godliness or covering their wickedness and the coming judgment with some type of outer garment. And he reminds us, there's no respect of persons with God. God does not look on the color of your skin, the size of your house, the year model of your pickup. God does not look on the level of your education or your heritage or your family. God is no respecter of persons. And God makes it very plain for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no respect of persons with God. With that in mind, he writes to this group of religious folks. He says, I just want you to know a few things. Verse number one, we'll make some points this way. Number one, re religious people are sinners too. Religious people are sinners too. So look at the Bible says in verse 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man. He says there's no excuse. Just because you're listening to this letter being read in the church at Rome does not mean that you're excused from the penalty of sin. Thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. He says, now look. I know you're looking back and listening and seeing everything that was written about the heathen, the Gentile, the God deniers, that they are backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, etc., etc. He says, but I want you to understand something. You are without, you, are, you have no excuse. You're inexcusable. He says, and if you find yourself judging these folks who have the baser sins, I want you to understand something. Thou judgest another and condemn yourself. You judge another and you condemn yourself. Isn't it so easy for us religious people? I mean, good night. We come to church on Wednesday night. I wear clean shoes to church. Isn't it easy for us to get judgmental? I mean, we see somebody that doesn't look like us, doesn't act like us. And we immediately think, oh, they need the Lord. Well, I'll tell you something. The Lord will clean up a person's outside, and he always does. But the only way to see transformation, real transformation, is to see God change someone's inside. And what God does on the inside, when it changes the outside, then it really means something. But if you think somehow because you look a certain way or talk a certain way or have a certain routine that maybe includes attending church, that does not make you a born-again child of God. And Paul says, look, God is no respecter of persons. Religious people are sinners too. He says, and if you look down your nose and judge these people, these heathen Gentile, he says, whereas you judge another, you condemn yourself. Well, this happens over and over in the Bible. There's a story I love. David, Bathsheba, Uriah, the high tyrant, Bathsheba's husband, Samuel, and a poor man's lamb. What's all that have to do with everything? I'll tell you. David lusted after Bathsheba. They had an extramarital affair. Bathsheba comes and says, hey, look, I'm going to have a baby. Uriah the Hittite is nobly fighting for his king David. David does everything he can to get Uriah to come home to try to take the scandal away, but Uriah wouldn't do it. Uriah ends up going to the front lines, getting murdered. 
David marries Bathsheba. It makes him look like he's really taking the poor widow in and the new baby. He fooled some people on the outside. But I'll have you know something. He never fooled God. God sent the prophet Samuel. And Samuel comes to David the king and says, David, I'm going to tell you a story. This is something that's happening. He says, listen, here. There's a rich man. He had a guest come in to town, wants to feed the guest. And he's got hundreds and hundreds of sheep. But you know what that rich man did? That rich man went to the poor man's house who has one sheep. One sheep, it's their pet. Sleeps in their bed. That's gross, ain't it? Lives in their home. And the rich man went and took the poor man's lamb and slaughtered it and fed his guest. David is so mad. He says, tell me who he is. And he will suffer the consequences and the wrath of the king. And Samuel looks David square in the eyeballs and says, Thou art the man. Hmm. You know what David did? The Bible says it like this. Thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. That's what he did. David had already excused his sin because it didn't seem to be in the open any longer. But God says... You condemn another, you judge another, you condemn yourself. It happened. How about this story? You remember this story? It was a prodigal son. That low down, good for nothing, dirty dog. Wants to waste away all his daddy'd work for with riotous living. He's even bold enough to say, Give me what's mine, daddy. And he goes off into a far country and he wastes. His inheritance. He's awful, isn't he? He's terrible. Finally, he comes himself in the hog slop one day, makes his way back to daddy's house. He says, Maybe I could just be a servant. His dad, father, forgives him. Isn't it a beautiful picture? We all have a prodigal heart. His father forgives him. The old prodigal son, you know what he did? He was. Bold and courageous and wrong. But then I want you to watch. He's come home. The dad says, Kill the fatted calf. Who objects? The older brother. <laughs> Daddy. I'm sure he said it just like that. Daddy. Or maybe he said, Father. You know, I've been so good. What's he do? He says, I've done all this. I've done this and this and this and this and this. And you're not throwing a party for me. Do you know what the older brother did? He judged the prodigal. Condemned himself. You see, there are sins of commission. There are also sins of spirit and attitude. The Bible says religious people are sinners too. How about this one? Let me read this to you. Luke chapter number 18. You may have time to turn there. Luke chapter number 18. Verse number 9. I have a sword drill here. As soon as I get it, I'm reading it. I don't want to take up too much preaching time. Luke 18, beginning in verse number 9. The Bible says... And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves, which trusted in themselves, which trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and despised others. Huh. Well, who was Jesus speaking to? The same group of potential people and problems that Paul was writing to in Romans chapter number 2. He spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off 
would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. What did the Pharisee do? The Pharisee judged another and condemned himself. Folks, it is important that we know religious people are sinners too. Look at the verse continues to say in verse number 1, Romans chapter number 2. Thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. What does Paul say? He says, you judge these Gentiles for their wickedness, and you are guilty of the exact same things. You say, I'm not an adulterer. But Jesus, in the Beatitudes, says if you look on a woman in lust, you're an adulterer. If you tell a lie, you're a liar. If you steal even something small, you're a thief. And the law condemns us. Religious people are sinners too. And Paul wanted to let the church know, don't get arrogant about your religiousness. Because about the time you get arrogant of your religiousness, your pride condemns you. Your judgment continue, con condemns you. And you are guilty of the same things that these evil, wicked Gentiles, backbiters, haters of God, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Those same people. You see, when you look down your self-righteous nose and judge others and fail to acknowledge the fact that you are a sinner saved by grace, redeemed from the curse of your sin, We've got to be careful. Religious people are sinners too. Verse number two. We are all judged by truth and not appearance. We are all judged by truth and not appearance. The Bible says in verse number two. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. We are all judged by truth and not appearance. The Bible says man looketh on the outward appearance. But God looks on the heart. We somehow believe that if we can clean up everything on the outside and protect our reputation, then we're okay. That's not how God works. How does God judge? God judges according to truth. What's the truth? The truth is what you'll answer to. We're judged not by our standard, but God's standard. You know what the temptation was? The temptation was to say, you know, compared to them, I'm doing pretty good. Compared to them, I'm doing pretty good. I mean, look what I provide for my kids. I mean, look what I do for my family. Now, look what I do. Look at my schedule. I go to church. I give in the offering plate. And all those things are good. But they do not satisfy the righteous demands of God. And you will be judged by truth. And the truth is all men are sinners. And Jesus is the only way to be saved. We're all judged by truth. That's why David wrote in his psalm, in the 51st psalm, prompted by his sin with Bathsheba and the judgment of Samuel saying, You're the man. He writes Psalm 51. To God, he says, Thou desirest truth in the inward parts. He says, You desire for me to be clean on the inside. What's on the inside is what matters the most to God. It's a fact. Once you get Jesus on the inside, the outside changes. But do not think that somehow exterior conformity will produce a righteous heart. It won't. Only Jesus can wash our sins away. And if somehow you wear your cloak of religion or your connection to a church or your history as a family of God-fearing people, if you wear that around as some token to your righteousness, you're a sinner too. 
And God cares more about truth than appearance. Number three, verse number three. We are without excuse. We're without excuse. Just in case you think you're going to get by with some type of outward conformity and not a personal relationship with Jesus, the Bible just wants to make it really clear you are without excuse. Verse number three, thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Do you really think that you'll escape the judgment of God? If you look down your self-righteous nose and judge them, and yet you're still guilty of sin and you are a sinner in need of a Savior, do you think that you will be excused? He says, thou shalt. Do you think that you'll escape the judgment of God? That's why the, ver the passage begins with verse number 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable. There's no excuse. You will not escape the judgment of God. The Bible says in verse number 2, we are sure... That the judgment of God is according to truth. Be sure your sins will find you out. We are inexcusable. We are without excuse. You see, there's no respect of persons with God. God cares about the inward man. Verse number four. Point number four. God's goodness leads to repentance. Do you know it's easy to get to a place in our lives... When we're not having great struggles, we have what we need. Now, this is a message that must be preached to the affluent. It must be preached to the United States of America. We are so blessed. We're so blessed. I'm so thankful for the blessings of God on this nation. We have so much to praise God for. My lands. There are people all over this world wondering if they're going to have enough water for tomorrow. If they're going to have enough flour to make enough bread to feed their kids tomorrow. And I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to eat one of my four meals tomorrow. Do y'all eat four? I try to. We're so blessed. And honestly, we've got it made in so many ways. And sometimes it's easy to get in this mindset. And the devil loves to rock us to sleep in all of our blessing. But look what the Bible says. God's goodness is to lead us to repentance. The Bible says, verse number 4, Despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering? not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Just because you got it made does not mean that you're right with God. Just because you're not suffering at this moment does not mean that you do not need to do business with God in your heart. Just because you got it made this moment does not mean that the judgment of God is not coming. As a matter of fact, God shows us His love. God extends His mercy. The Bible says we love Him because He first loved us. His love is designed to cause us to love Him. His goodness is to cause us to understand that He is good to me even though I'm rotten. The goodness of God leads us to repentance. And Paul's just telling this church at Rome, he says, now look, if you're sitting in this church and you've put on the clothes of the church and taken on the routine of the church and used the language of the church, but you know in your heart you're living in sin or you've never been saved. And he says, I want to remind you of something. Just because you're not suffering does not mean that you do not need to get right with God. As a matter of fact, the opposite is true. We should be humbled by the fact that God, in spite of our wickedness, in spite of our rottenness, in spite of our flesh that rears up at times, God, in spite of that, is good to us. The Bible says in verse 4, Despisest thou the riches of his goodness? What's it mean to despise something? The riches of his goodness? 
we, we just kind of forget about it. We just ignore it. We, we just fail to acknowledge that the riches of God's goodness falls on our lives. How many of you just be honest right now and you could say amen to the fact that God blesses you with the richness of his goodness? Would you say amen? Amen. You know what an acknowledgement of the richness of God's goodness should do? It should highlight any sin in our hearts and cause us to desire to repent because God is so good to us even though we are us. We are who we are. Do you despise the riches of his goodness? How about his forbearance? How many of you know that you're not getting everything you, should, you, you deserve in regards to punishment? How many of you know you got it better than you deserve? Amen. That's all of us. You know what? God is forbearing. He's long-suffering. He's long-suffering. And, he's, and Paul says, now look, church. Hey. I want to understand something. God's goodness leads to repentance. Hey, look. When we look and see how good God is, we should humble our hearts and say, Lord, please forgive me for my rottenness and sinning against such bright light, such sweet favor. God's goodness leads to repentance. Verse number five, point number five. Hard hearts increase wrath. Hard hearts increase wrath. You know it's so easy, even in a setting like this, where you come and faithfully sit in the preaching, teaching of God's word to have a hard heart. Now look what the Bible says about that. Verse number five. But after thy hardness... Hardness, an impenitent heart. After thy hardness, an impenitent heart. Impenitent literally means unwilling to change. After thy hardness, an impenitent heart. I want you to ask God to show you something right now. Do you know what we have the ability to do? We have the ability to sear our conscience. We have the ability to take out of our hearts things that are blatantly and rampantly sinful in our lives and excuse them. And our hearts get hard. We still look like Christians. We still attend church faithfully. But our hearts get hard and we continue in our sin. It's amazing to me how many professing Christians live in immorality. It's amazing to me how many professing Christians live in Secret, wicked sins. The Bible says, After thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath. I've put in quotations the little phrase, treasurest up. I want you to know something. Every day you live with a hard heart in rebellion to God, you are putting wrath in the bank. 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 And we'll answer. You're treasuring up wrath to the day of wrath. If you're here and you're lost, you're treasuring up wrath to the day of wrath. You've let your heart get hard. You're impenitent. You're going to do what you want to do. It don't matter what the Bible says. It doesn't matter what the preacher says. It doesn't matter what happens. You're going to do what you want to do. The Bible says... Hard hearts increase wrath. Verse for 5, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. What's going to happen? There's a day of wrath and there is revelation. It will come out. Be sure your sins will find you out. Revelation. Don't be, that word's not scary. Revelation. It just means it's revealed. Revelation. I just revealed to you I've got a pocket on my shirt. This is the revelation of tonight. There's a pocket on his shirt. It's a revelation. And God's going to reveal not what's under your coat, but God knows what's in your heart. Hard hearts increase wrath. The next point, the sixth point, covers verses 6 through 10. But I want you to hear this. These are very easily misunderstood verses, but they are so important. Here's the point I want to make. Judgment is measured by works. Okay? 
the amount of judgment that we get is measured by our works. Salvation, salvation is determined by faith. Now look, if you're saved, hallelujah, we are saved from the penalty of sin, praise the Lord. Judgment, if you're lost, judgment is measured by works. All right, let me share with you this verse of Scripture. Verse number 6, the Bible says, Speaking of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. What does God do? God's a faithful judge. He will render to every man according to his deeds. Verse number 7, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Now, this does not mean you work your way to heaven. You get saved by grace, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you are saved, guess what a evidence of that is? It's a desire to live for God. Now look, if you have the opportunity to experience these things at times, I'm not talking about perfection, but to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, it's, a, it's an emphasis on patience. By the way, have you found out? I'll tell you something. Religious people, people who think they're really something because of their religion, are impatient people. They're impatient. They're unkind. They think because of what they've done, they deserve something better than they deserve. But a saved person, you know what? A saved person, somebody who is humbly seeking the Lord and aware the wretchedness of their sin and the righteousness of God. That person is patient. Things get difficult, that's okay. God is faithful. Things get hard, that's okay. God's grace is sufficient. Patient, continuance, and well-doing. Seek for glory and honor and immortality. Eternal life, seeking eternal things. But, verse number 8, But unto them that are contentious. I've met a lot of contentious religious people contentious and do not obey the truth. What do you do? These contentious people, they do not obey the truth. They do what they want to do instead of obeying the truth. What do they do? Sometimes people disobey the truth because they say, I want to be my own man. The Bible doesn't say it works like that. You see, the Bible says you are obeying one of two things. You are either obeying the, you are either obeying the truth or you are obeying unrighteousness. Them that are contentious do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. What do they do? What are you obeying? What are you obeying? You say, I'm my own man. I'm obeying. No, I, I, I. Don't work like that. You can obey the truth, submit to the truth, and invoke on your life the blessings of God, or you can be the servant of unrighteousness. You're obeying unrighteousness. If you think somehow I can live in sin and do what I want to do, you are not your own man. You're not your own woman. You're not making your own, ser your own decision. You are a servant of unrighteousness. Folks, it's better to be a servant of God. Serve God. He says, But unto them that are contentious, do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. To them comes indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Now the Bible says something very important here as we bring this to a conclusion. The Bible says, now look, you're inexcusable. He said, I know it's easy to look down your nose and cast judgment on the heathen. But this message is to the religious. This message is to the people who sat and heard the preaching of God's word. This message is to the people who've attended Sunday school. This message is to the people whose parents raised them in church. This message is to the people who've been taught better, but are living in sin anyway. He says, I want you to know something. There's wrath and judgment. 
that will fall on folks who disobey God. And there's blessing that will abound to folks who obey God. And the Bible says twice, to the Jew first and also the Greek. To the Jew first and also the Greek. Why? Because God holds different people accountable at different levels. The Jew who'd been taught the Old Testament law, who'd been taught the Ten Commandments, who'd been taught the truth. The Jew first. The Jew was held to a higher accountability level than the heathen Gentile. And I want you to know something. The people who've attended Bible preaching churches and know right from wrong and rebel against God anyway to you first and also the Gentile. We are held accountable for the light that we sin against. And oh, how shameful it is for us to sin against such great light. You know, I'm so thankful for the light that God has given me. I'm not speaking arrogantly in any form or fashion. But I'm thankful for servants of God, faithful who've taught me and invested in me. I got a little lady on my mind right now who's my Sunday school teacher at Middle Fort Baptist Church. I'm thankful because of what she invested in me. I received light. I'm thankful for the influence of my home. I'm thankful for the influence of the churches I've been raised in and pastors that God has put in my life. I'm thankful. But you know what? I've been given a lot of light. I've been given a lot of light. And for me to sin against that light, it'd be extra bad. The Bible says, look, wrath falls to the Jew first and also the Greek. The Jew first because they're sinned against such great light. And so the message tonight is this. It concludes in our text, verse number 11. There's no respect of persons with God. Look, do not let... Some religious exterior prevent you or hide from you your need, first of all, to be saved. And do not let some religious exercise or exterior keep you from repenting and keeping your heart right with God as a Christian. That's why the Bible says God's no respecter of persons. And God says, you are inexcusable, O brethren. For God is no respecter of persons.